Okay. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much uh, for joining me for this hopefully 15 to 20 minute talk on um, three amazing black women artists. I really appreciate you taking the time out. I know we're all trying to learn a little bit more about specifically black women's history these days. Um, so hopefully this isn't gonna be enriching to um, what you might already know. So for those of you that I don't know or that don't know me, my name is Ellie Pinzeroni and um, I'm relatively new to the Galesburg area. We moved here about five years ago. Um, I've got three small children, uh, four, two, and seven months. So hopefully they won't be busting in right now. They're far away in the house. Um, but just to give you a little bit of my um, educational and professional background and what brought me to this material, um, my mom actually, who's on this Zoom, thanks mom, is the one who introduced me to the work of Faith Ringgold. Um, she took me to a, back in the day, it was like slide lecture talks um, as a, I think I was 13 or 14. And I got to go see Faith Ringgold go through all of her work um, chronologically sort of and give her take on everything. And I found the material and her work completely powerful and fascinating. And her personally just completely charismatic and I fell in love with her. So I was very much attuned to what she was doing um, even as a high schooler. And then fast forward as an undergraduate student at the University of Illinois, I study, I majored in gender women's studies, art history and United States history. And you're able to sort of choose um, smaller part, different parts of US history to focus on. And I took a lot of African-American women's history courses at that time. So that helped give me a little bit more context to some of the material Faith Ringgold was talking about in her work. Then as a graduate student, I went to American University in DC and their art history program is a strongly uh, feminist program. And they offered a course <laughs> that was entirely um, American women's feminist history. Um, and in that course, let's see. Sorry to see if I can, can I mute? Can everybody mute themselves? We're okay. That's okay. Um, maybe I should do it from my end. Anyway, in that American women's history course, I was introduced to Betty Saar and Karen May Weems. And because of my background, I was able to sort of draw a lot of connections among these women and see some parallel um, in their art. And that sort of formed the basis of what would become one of my thesis projects. And that 15 to 20 minute talk was selected um, as to be given as um, as a talk at the Biennial National Gallery Conference when I, back in 2007 when I was there. Um, so I hope that if you already knew about these artists that this sort of just enriches your appreciation for them. And I hope if it's new material for you that you're able to find something that really sparks your interest. Um, and for me professionally, I've worked at um, a contemporary art gallery in Chicago. I've worked um, as a old school slide digitizer for a professor of Tibetan art at Northwestern. Um, and my other area of concentration as a graduate student was Italian Renaissance art. So I'm kind of all over the board, um, but I hope you love um, learning about this just as much as I did. If you do have any questions or comments, um, if you could just save it to the end and I will do my very best to answer you or um, guide you to a place where you can get answers. Okay, so let's begin. The title of this um, paper presentation is called The Recreation of Memory as a Practice of Resistance, The Art of Betty Saar, Faith Ringgold, and Carrie Mae Weems. An exploration of the visual art of Betty Saar, Faith Ringgold, and Carrie Mae Weems will highlight their shared patterns of resistance, and specifically, the way memory is revised and reclaimed in their work. These artists locate the origin of black feminisms with the enslaved black women whom Angela Davis has deemed to be the quote, custodians of the house of resistance, end quote. While Ringgold and Saar began producing visual art decades before Weems began working in photography, we should not limit the dialogue among black feminist artists into only the old or new generational camps. The thematic connections among these three artists suggest the device of visual intervention with the past was deemed successful by later artists. 
Their strategies, however, do not appear in the work of male Harlem Renaissance artists like Jacob Lawrence and Romare Bearden. They did not foreground the individualized female black worker as a mover and shaker of revolution and empowerment. Similarly, black women and their narrative of resistance were largely absent from white feminist discourse. The images of Saar, Ringgold and Weems convey sadness, pointed wit, and a vigilance to recover and rewrite the past, present, and future. This is further illuminated by the work of Black feminist historians who have stressed the ever-present aspect of resistance in African-American women's history. This first set of images demonstrates the significance of the Black female worker as the foundation of resistance and empowerment and provides a means for strategically dismantling stereotypes. Let's see. In Supreme Quality, Betty Saar has centralized a Black female domestic worker and armed her with two large firearms. The inscription reads, extreme times call for extreme heroines. Saar's incendiary image is autobiographical in the sense that both her grandmother and mother were seamstresses, but it also calls attention to a history of Black women as domestic workers. Saar's figure in Supreme Quality is embedded in the center of the sculptural grouping. Her assemblage can be contrasted with Jacob Lawrence's image, images of black women performing domestic labor. In his 1945 work, Home Chores, Lawrence's female figure looks down and away from the viewer with her body turned entirely toward the basin. In Home Chores, the wash tub is the site of oppression, but in Supreme Quality, the heroine is physically and symbolically supported by the washboard and uses this object which represents historical resistance and labor as a platform to stake her claim as revolutionary leader. According to Betty Saar, her most well-known work, The Liberation of Aunt Jemima from 1972, was motivated by her desire to quote, transform a negative demeaning figure into a positive empowered woman, a warrior ready to combat servitude and racism, end quote. In this assemblage, Jemima is armed with a broom, pistol, and shotgun. Saar explicitly connects the historic strategic resistance of Black female labor with the present revolutionary leader. An important concept for understanding the empower, empowerment of the Black female worker was introduced in the scholarship of activist Angela Davis, who helped debunk the Black matriarch mammy stereotype and foreground the importance of women's domestic work within enslaved communities. Davis's 1971 essay, Reflections on the Black Woman's Role in a Community of Slaves, introduced the concept of the quote, black woman as the custodian of a house of resistance, end quote. Her work drew attention to the significance of black women's roles in their own dwellings, away from the master's space during slavery, stating that they were quote, performing the only labor of the slave community which could not be directly and immediately claimed by the oppressor, end quote. In other words, this labor became the only work that provided self-empowerment and resources to the enslaved community. The inscription of historical oppression onto the site of domestic labor is introduced in SARS I'll Bend But I Will Not Break from 1998. The vintage ironing board is topped with a drawing of the 1789 plan of the slave ship, the Brooks an image that she printed on rice paper in another work from the series. The implied compression of slaves on the ship, reinforced by the ritual of ironing, also alludes to the practice of branding that many slave owners use to punish runaways. Saar also references the iron shackles that bound slaves during Middle Passage. In this assemblage, Saar invites the viewer to interact with the functional domestic object and their participant is provoked to recall through the act of labor. Throughout the rest of her 1998 Workers and Warriors series, Betty Saar connects the successes of contemporary Black women to the efforts of previous generations. Saar's Lest We Forget the Strength of Tears of Those Who Toiled from 1998 presents a tall genealogical and matrilineal tree that has been built from the ground up. This work shows individual washboards stacked three high and depicts a slave on the bottom panel, laundresses in the second and third panels, 
On top of the washboards, a silver frame shows two black women, one of whom holds a diploma. Sar has explained, quote, my concerns are the struggle of memory against the attraction of forgetting. The washboard, a simple domestic tool, has become my format. For years, I have collected vintage washboards, and to me, they symbolize hard labor. By recycling them, I am honoring the memory of that labor and the working woman upon whose shoulders we now stand. Not only has freedom been achieved by standing on these shoulders, but they have also allowed a means to access education and professional success. Similarly, in Lest We Forget, upon whose shoulders we now stand, SAR features a nurse standing on the fictive shoulders of laundresses. SAR's transformation of domestic servant to armed soldier throughout her Workers and Warriors series offers a poignant, almost satirical counterpoint to the representations of masculinity within the Black Panther Party. Although SAR provided a visualization of Black women's powerful public revolutionary capabilities, Black women were still restricted, even in the circles of the Black Panther Party and the Black Arts Movement. The Black Panther Party was notoriously misogynist, with very few women members, most notably including Angela Davis, Asada Shakur, and Kathleen Cleaver. The Black Arts Movement similarly perpetuated a patriarchal hierarchy. The movement thrived on works of Black men, including celebrated Harlem Renaissance artist Romare Bearden. His Black artist collective, The Spiral Group, consisted of 13 men and just one woman. Faith Ringgold submitted slides to Bearden with hopes of joining Spiral, but he rejected her paintings, stating that, quote, it is hard to imagine them being produced by someone referred to as so petite, end quote. In response to such patronizing exclusion, Ringgold's visual art was enriched by her participation in 1970s feminist activism an alliance that many Black women were uneasy to forge. Ringgold embraced quilting as a medium that was both charged with familial and cultural tradition, and yet innovative in terms of the contemporary art scene. All of her story quilts were derivative of family episodes, many orbited on an axis of Black female experiences. Sewing and performing piecework were part of Ringgold's own personal history and provided agency for her mother and grandmother. Ringgold's quilt of a quilting bee from 1997 demonstrates the spirit of collaboration and community among women. The figures are at ease and quilt together within an inspiring environment, which celebrates their talent, as well as implicitly referencing Ringgold's quilting ability as the artist. In her quilts, Ringgold often brought together groups of living and dead women, as evidenced in her quilting bee at Arles from 1991. She even created a quilt where multiple versions of herself attend a party. Ringgold not only demonstrated narrative exchanges among her figures, but often incorporated her own words and stories across her quilted canvases instead of publishing separate statements. One of her early narrative quilts dealt with rewriting and re-imaging the myth of Aunt Jemima. For Ringgold, Aunt Jemima held universal significance and the artist rejected the contemporary responses to mammy images in art. She neither found power in the images of the revolutionary Jemima, like that of Betty Saar, nor with the subservient Jemima, who appears only as a floating head exemplified in American icons and myths by Andy Warhol. Ringgold found this binary of either revolutionary woman or docile servant, especially problematic because she herself identified as a quote, big black woman, end quote. Ringgold's 1982 quilt, Who's Afraid of Aunt Jemima, features Jemima Blakely, a figure who defies the stereotype in a new way. Ringgold's quilt forges a new identity for her as mother, friend, and neighbor. Ringgold's Jemima appears as a contemporary woman Without the label, we might mistake it as a portrait of the artist. Instead of creating a new image for Aunt Jemima, Carrie Mae Weems inscribed new meaning onto one of the original images of Mammy in her 1995 series, From Here I Saw What Happened and I Cried. Weems superimposed text on tinted daguerreotypes taken during slavery and reconstruction. The image for the work, You Became Mammy, Mama, Mother, and Then Yes, Confidant, Ha, originates from Prentice Polk's photograph, The Boss, a portrait that was intended to be a seated shot. 
This female subject, however, told Polk she preferred to be imaged standing with hands at hips. Weems stated she wanted to, quote, give them a different kind of status first and foremost, and to heighten their beauty and their pain and sadness too from the ordeal of being photographed. The circular lens-like format, red tinting, and textual inscriptions are Weems's intervention on the way in which these figures are remembered. As Weems has stated, she is, quote, giving a voice to a subject that historically has had no voice, end quote. Weems's methodology, which energizes black and white photographs by tinting, reframing, and inscriptions, is also applied to her image of a rolling pin from her photo series, 22 Million Very Tired and Very Angry People. The work includes text across the bottom, which refers to the famous excerpt from a speech by Malcolm X, in which he called for freedom by any means necessary. Weems's image explicitly connects black women's domestic work with resistance and revolution. The tools of domestic labor and revolution, including the washboard, washing board, ironing board, and rolling pin, were objects often passed from mothers to daughters. With this in mind, it is unsurprising that relationships among female family members are consistently featured in the art of Ringgold, Saar, and Weems. This next set of images emphasizes female family relationships and provides another way in which memory is preserved, exchanged, and reinvented. Ringgold worked with her mother until her death in 1983. Saar has collaborated with her daughters for years, and Carrie Mae Weems has featured her own mother and sisters, as well as recasting a fictive young self in a series of photographs. Ringgold is well known for her quilts and wall hangings, which were first created in collaboration with her mother, Willie Posey. Posey was a successful fashion designer and dressmaker in Harlem, but she also had a background in freehand traditional African-American inspired piece work, which she had learned from her grandmother. This pieced work compiled fabric as a means of rearranging to achieve a unified piece. The physical construction of the work additionally allowed Ringgold an element of control over historical subject matter that she initially felt helpless to change. Ringgold's slave rape series showcased a subject matter and experience that had been silenced and excluded from American canonical history and social consciousness. Historian Hazel Carby has asserted that, quote, the institutionalized rape of black women has never been as powerful a symbol of black oppression as the spectacle of lynching, end quote. Three works in the slave rape series were portraits of Ringgold and her daughters inserted into the situation of their ancestors. This series was Ringgold's first collaboration with her mother, Willie Posey. Their partnership adds another layer of genera generational autobiography to the work. Ringgold stated that this series was a way of releasing her frustration over, quote, things we can do nothing about. It is an obsession we cannot escape. So we isolate it, picture it, and then we are free to let it go, end quote. For Ringgold, Saar, and Weems, the reclamation of visual identity involves personal narratives and recognizable faces and objects. This allows them to inscribe every image with personal control as well as political significance. Following the death of her mother in 1983, Ringgold created Mother's Quilt, which shows a mother and seven daughters. The female figures are described with heavily contoured outlines of yarn and cloth. Their heads and necks evoke nesting doll figurines and generational connections among women. The nesting doll illusion also describes the building up and expanding to fit over the previous doll or generation. By building on past tradition of the quilt, Ringgold is able to explore these issues. This, recall, this recalls the approach of Betty Saar and her washboard assemblages, built from the ground up, literally and symbolically. Carrie Mae Weems's Untitled Kitchen Table series includes many scenes that depict the relationship between a mother and daughter. Weems stars in the series as the female protagonist who, quote, in her own words, quote, takes charge of her image, controls it, plays it, and likes it, looks back and loves it, end quote. In her series, May Days Long Forgotten, Weems stated she was specifically looking for, quote, a girl who reminded me of myself, end quote. She photographed the girl with her siblings and cousins for Mayflowers and after Manet. 
the large scale of the photographs and the direct gazes of the girls is a way of intimately introducing the next generation, as well as her memories of her own childhood into the visual narrative. In three prints from the series, Maydays, Weems reasserts this theme in a powerful triptych presentation that centralizes her assertive female sitters while formally reclaiming the powerful iconography of sacred images. The triptych format used by Saar, Ringgold, and Weems encourages memorializing the past, contemplation, and spirituality. These triptychs constructed through assemblage, painted textiles, and photography are used to confront the audience and assert a powerful presence through monumentality. The art of Betty Saar, Faith Ringgold, and Kiri Mae Weems involves recollection and reinvention of the past in medium and subject matter, and they engage with the traditions identified with bl by Black feminist historians. Their art shares the recreation of historical narrative, the foregrounding of female family relationships, textual inscriptions, and the use of self-portraiture, all as means of reinvention. Each artist has created a responding visual voice and forged Black feminist dialogue that successfully intertwines the personal and the political. Memory provides one of the most personal aspects of individual and group identity, and it is the shared reworking of this theme that has made the works of these artists intimate, powerful, and political. Thank you. That is the end of my talk on these three artists.